Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who is Moses? Most of us, when we think of Moses, we think of Charlton Heston with his long hair, standing over the Red Sea, telling the waters to part. Here are some of the facts. We know that that happened as well, but you know the story. He was born in Egypt. Amram and Yoshebed, his mother and father, were a couple of slaves in the land of Egypt. They had been for almost 400, they're not that time, about 390 years at that time. And he grew up after having been pulled out of the river by the daughter of Pharaoh. So he was raised as a prince. He got angry with an Egyptian and killed him. And so that got him, he thought he got it covered up, but then he saw a couple of Israelites fighting and he approached them and they said, well, are you going to kill us like the Egyptian? Now, he, the word was going to get around. Pharaoh was going to chase him down. So he had to leave town. Then, leaving town, he comes upon the land of Midian, finds, I mean, if you watch the Ten Commandments, you know the story, but maybe you know it from Exodus as well. He marries Zipporah, the daughter of the priest of Midian, and he spends the next 40 years of his life as a shepherd. He has a couple of sons, and that's what gets us to the point of where we are with our Old Testament text this evening. By this time, he's 80 years old, and he's the son-in-law of, of the priest of the area that he lives in. He's a husband, he's a father, and he's a shepherd. He has been for some 40 years. So the question one might ask is, Moses a paragon of the faith, as he is often portrayed? Well, this would be a true statement. If you look through scripture, you can see that in many cases, he is a paragon of faith. Or is he a pensive, pining, pipsqueak, pipsqueak of a man? Pipsqueak, does anybody use that word anymore? That too would be a true statement. As God is speaking to him in this bush that is burning and not being consumed. He's looking for excuses. God, in this short narrative, defines for us, actually not just who Moses is, but who everyone is in the narrative. We have God, the bush which burns as it is not consumed. We have Moses asking, who am I? Who am I to do the things you're asking me to do? We have Jethro, the priest of Midian. Moses' father-in-law, who later, when he comes back, he learns some valuable lessons from his father-in-law. And we have all those ites that Terry so amply read earlier. You know, those Canaanites and those Hittites and those Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And on the end of that, we also have the Egyptians. In this process, he helps us to better understand who Moses is, someone who we can relate to because of the struggles he has in his life. What is that you say you can't relate to Moses? Well, there's a lot of things that I just explained to you that you should be able to relate to. In God's presence, in the holy area, Moses tells him to take off his sandals. God tells him to take off his sandals. You're on holy ground. So Moses, in the presence of God, realizes his unholiness. We, too, when we are in the presence of God, should realize our unholiness. Jethro, this is his land, so he's a son, a son-in-law, a husband, a father, or you women, daughter-in-law, wife, mother, all the different aspects of what it is to be part of a family we can relate to. People of whom Moses had no part, those ites and those Egyptians, those are the people on the outside, the people who are trying to make things difficult for us, maybe the world, you could make that connection. It is clear that Moses has a calling in this text to get God's people out of Egypt and into the land flowing with milk and honey. That's what God is called, the action he is calling them to. But what does Moses say? As I said earlier, he says, 
Who am I? Who am I to do this? God, you don't expect me to go up against big, powerful Pharaoh. Besides, your chosen people, you may remember, they don't like me very much. That's why I left 40 years ago. You may remember they threatened to expose me for it as a murderer. He has had 40 years, 40 years to build up in his mind just how much those people far away hated him. They probably weren't even thinking about him. You remember, as I said, he left under bad circumstances. He's a fugitive, a murderer. And the people who God's calling him to defend and bring out, they ask, as I said earlier, you're going to kill us next? Do we ask, who am I when we are given callings in life as students, as employees, as employers, family members, parishioners, all of the things that we are called to do in life, we're called to do them as members of the body of Christ, loving others for him and loving him for others. We create in our, for ourselves our own little monsters that don't exist. We put up walls when there are none there as an excuse not to do whatever it is we know God is telling us to do. After God calms Moses' concerns, his fears, that he is unqualified, you may have heard it before, a good thing when we start to worry about being qualified to do anything for God is he doesn't call qualified. He, call, he qualifies those he calls to do things. Moses comes up with other excuses. But what if? What if they don't listen to me? What if I don't speak so good? What if it's too hard or it's too uncertain? And Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? You may remember a couple of weeks ago, we had Jacob, and Jacob asked that, asked that question, and God didn't even answer him. He just touched his hip and gave him another name and sent him on his way. But here, God answers. Do we ask, ever ask, what if God I won't have the words to say if anyone confronts me about what I believe. If my neighbor or my friend or my coworker or my classmate or my cousin, if they ask me something, I won't know what to say. And even if, even if I don't know what to say, how will I deal with rejection? Because in the world that we live in, if you speak truth and love about God and his word, you're gonna deal with some rejection. I'll have to live next door to this person who is my neighbor. What? I don't want them to think I have to work with this person. I don't want them to think I, I have to go to school every day with this person. I don't want them to think I have to see this person at family reunions every time. I don't want them to think. I don't want them to think that I'm some kind of fill in the blank with your favorite thing you're afraid of being called for speaking the truth in love. Jesus free, Bible thumper, holier than thou or one they're calling a lot of Christians now, bigots. You know, don't make waves. Only talk about weather, things that are unoffensive. Oh, wait a minute, weather, climate change, that's gonna be a problem too. You can't talk about anything anymore. Even if it were possible to find some nebulous, non-offensive thing to talk about, we don't have that option. That's not what we're called to do. We cannot hide our head in the sand like ostriches. It's clear that we too have a calling to share God's light with a dark and dying world. Telling them of the eternal land flowing with milk and honey. Lucky for us, we don't have to stand up to Pharaoh. Just our own fears and the world that surrounds us. What beautiful things wait for those who are covered in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the kinds of things we should look forward to opportunities to share. For those who have been, been delivered from the bondage to sin, 
death and the devil. What are those beautiful things brought, bought for us by Christ? The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire, out of the midst of the bush. God appears to us in the burning bush, in the burning truth revealed in his word. The truth about how much he loves us, so much that he gave his son to die for us. For those of you who are longtime worshipers here, probably this altar looks kind of strange without the cross sitting on it. And for our guests, you may not have even missed it. However, if it troubles you that that, that piece of artwork was not there, that's a good thing. Tradition and art that focuses on who we believe in and what he did for us is a good thing. But at the same time, if it bothered you so much that you couldn't think about the Savior who bled and died for you that it represents, then we've got to be careful not to turn even our own artwork into idols. It's a dangerous thing. So we see it there, we appreciate it, but we don't worship the cross or the corpus. We worship the God that it represents. That's the throne from which he purchased our salvation. And it really isn't him. But what is behind him when we celebrate the Lord's Supper is him. All of these great things that we have. Moses was told, take off your sandals, you stand on holy ground. We come and kneel at this rail. We too are on holy ground. We respectfully receive the gifts that he calls us to come and receive from him. Because this is where the creator of the universe comes to his faithful and feeds them with his body and blood, giving them forgiveness. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said. Here I am, said Moses. God sees us. God calls us. When his law shows us that we are broken sinners in need of forgiveness, and we with contrite hearts say to him, Here I am, Lord. Just like he called Moses, he calls each of us by name. He says, He sees you because he is with you. He's never not with you, he's always with you. He is never far away. Yes, he sits, as we confess, at the right hand of the Lord, at the right hand of God. But he also is everywhere else he promises to be, including the supper. Then he reminds us where we are. The place on which you are standing, as I said earlier, is holy ground. Made holy, not because this is a special structure, not because the grove where the bush was was a special place, but because the God of creation was present there, making that place holy. Enjoy the gifts that God gives you in his presence. Baptism, Lord's Supper, absolution. All sweet gifts of forgiveness. God gives them to you. Not because you deserve it, because none of us do. But because Jesus paid the price for it. He bled and died on the cross for it. He says to you, I am. I am sends you into a dark and dying world. And he also says to us in verse 12 of the text, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, out of darkness, you shall serve God on this mountain. You will serve me together in the community you've been called to love and serve in. And you will worship me together in my house and receive the gifts that I have prepared for you. In Jesus' name, amen.